In this video, we're going to work through a question which was asked to one of our students applying to Cambridge to do maths. Now, needless to say, there's a huge amount of variation in what's asked by Oxford and Cambridge interviewers uh, in mathematical subjects, both within and between colleges. But nonetheless, this should serve to give you a good idea of the type of thing that they ask and to help you to know what to expect in your interview. So in this question, our student was told that we have an apple, a carrot and a banana, but we can't decide what to eat for lunch. Using only a fair coin, which we are allowed to throw as many times as we want, we need to develop a strategy which will let us choose our lunch at random such that each option is equally likely to be picked. And then in parts two and three of the problem, we're going to do some things with our strategy. We're going to explicitly verify it, that it works. And then we're going to calculate an expected number of throws of the coin until we get to eat our lunch. So, okay, first of all, I guess we should try to keep things as simple as possible. So could I do it with only one throw? They say we can throw as many times as we like. Well, if I throw once, I've got two outcomes, head and tail. Clearly that cannot work, right? There's no way we can achieve this with one throw because there are three lunches that are all supposed to have a chance and yet there'd only be two outcomes. So that doesn't do the job. Okay, so what if we try two throws? Notice that we're not rushing to anything hugely complicated, but we're thinking about the simplest options first and gradually ramping up the complexity as required. So if I throw twice, I guess I've got to uh, take into account all of the possibilities, head, 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 tail, tail, head, tail, tail. Now there is a question as to whether we treat these guys as the same, right? Do we care about the order? I think we definitely would want to care about the order because if I start treating head, tail and tail, head as the same, then the mixed outcome is much more likely than the head, head, tail, tail outcomes. And that seems to be antithetical to our goal of actually trying to make every lunch equally likely. So I think we should definitely treat these as the same, or rather as distinct, sorry, distinct based on the ordering. So this is good. We've got enough options to go around now, but the problem is we've got too many, right? We've only got three lunches and yet we've got four outcomes. And moreover, four is not a multiple of three. So if you had a number of outcomes which were a multiple of three, let's say you had six outcomes, you could say two of them are apple, two of them are banana, two of them are carrot. Great, that works. But four is not a multiple of three. And moreover, if I add more throws, I'm only going to get eight outcomes, 16 outcomes, going to double each time because I'm only ever going to get powers of two. It's never going to be a multiple of three. So we seem to have a real problem in terms of what to do with our excess outcomes. Well, increasing the number of throws doesn't make the problem any easier. So why don't we try and stick with two throws and see what we can do? So for instance, I could certainly say, let's eat an apple if we get heads heads. I could also certainly say that I'm gonna eat a banana if I get heads tails. I could say I'm going to eat a carrot if I get tails heads. But then the issue is, what do we do with tails tails? I can't assign any of the lunches to it because if I do, then that lunch has got a disproportionately large probability. But what if I say, and this is the idea that they're looking for you to come up with, what if I say that in this extra unwanted outcome, I throw again? If I just repeat the process in that outcome, that doesn't advantage any of the lunches because on each throw they're equally likely to win and so this must keep it fair. So this strategy should work. Each lunch gets one outcome and the fourth outcome just means you repeat the process as a tiebreaker. Now of course someone could be skeptical and say mm, are you sure throwing again really doesn't give favour to one option? Of course it doesn't, but it's reasonable to now try to, as we're asked to in the second part of the question, explicitly compute the probability that we eat an apple in order to verify that it really does work. Um, so let's see what happens if we do that. Now, because we've in some sense got a sequence of outcomes, you throw a pair of coins, say, or you throw the coin twice, then you may have to go again, then you may have to go again. It seems appropriate to work with a probability tree here. So I guess we need to have the possibility that we eat the apple outright. We've got the possibility that we throw again. And then rather than giving banana and carrot their own branches, just to keep the tree tidier, 
I might as well just group those together into the not apple outcome. So we can keep our tree tidier by grouping together outcomes which are functionally the same. If we're only interested in whether we eat an apple, a banana or a carrot are equivalent really. So apple happened with heads heads, that's a quarter. Throw again happened with tails tails, that's a quarter. And not apple could be heads tails or tails heads, that's going to be a half. So obviously in the apple outcome, great, game over, we've won. In the not apple outcome, we lost. In throw again, we now have to branch again. And already at this point, we might start to get a bit nervous. Because what you'll notice is that this probability tree can clearly go on forever. Because there's, although it's unlikely that we keep having to throw again, it can happen infinitely many times if, if we're really unlucky, right? I mean, eventually you'll get one or the other, but there's no upper limit to the number of throws we could have to do. So infinite probability trees actually feature quite commonly in these interviews. And there are two ways to deal with them. One is to tackle the infinity head on and say, OK, there are infinitely many uh, possible outcomes I'm interested in, but I'm not afraid of that. I'm just going to add up all these infinitely many things and hope that they arrange themselves into a nice series which I can evaluate. That will work here. In more difficult situations, you can have to use an idea which I usually call looping. There won't be time to go through that in this video because it's overkill for this slightly more straightforward problem. But if you take our interview primer course, you'll learn about that in lots of detail. But let's do it the, the more straightforward way. So these are the good outcomes, apple, 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 and so on. And what you can see is that the first good outcome happens with probability a quarter. The next one happens with probability a quarter squared, a quarter, oops a quarter, a quarter. And then the next one after that, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. And each one, each opportunity to eat the apple has an extra quarter associated to it because you have to have had one more throw again before you got your apple. Now, fortunately for us, this has indeed arranged itself into really the only type of infinite series which is straightforward to evaluate. And that is an infinite geometric series. So we get first term over one minus the common ratio which is a quarter over three quarters, which is a third. And that's exactly what we wanted, right? We wanted all three outcomes to be equally likely. So it's good that we've got this outcome. This shows our strategy is working. Now, finally, in part three, we need to decide the expected number of throws of the coin before we get to eat lunch. Now, I will just point out that in all likelihood, this last part of the question will only have been asked to candidates who were already doing very well and had already gotten very far in the interview. So even if you don't quite manage to crack this part, there's still a very good chance you'll be receiving an offer just for having gotten that far. So expected number of throws. Now, this is a, a good point to mention something about these interviews, which is they very often use the idea of expectation of a random variable. This hasn't really been formally covered in the amount of A-level material that you'll cover before your interviews for some years, but the interviewers seem not to be aware of this and they still ask questions using expectation. So it's worth just quickly pausing to notice, oh, to note what expectation means. So if I have a random variable which I will call x. So that's just something which takes different values according to different probabilities. For example, um, we could let x be the score I get when I throw a fair die, and it can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. We say that the expectation of x is the sum over all the possible values, which I'll denote by lowercase x, multiplied by the probability that you take that value. Now, why do I multiply by the probability that you take that value when you add up all the outcomes? Because you want more likely outcomes to count more and less likely outcomes to count less. So in an interview, if they talk about something being expected, the expected number of whatever, they're really talking about this notion of the expectation. So that means in part three, um, first of all, we should just count the number of pairs of throws because, of course, in our strategy, we throw twice at a time. So we count the number of pairs of throws and then double it, first of all, rather than worrying about the fact that each go is really two goes. Um, and let's see. So if we again quickly draw our tree, so we've got, and I guess now in this situation, because we only care about when we eat lunch, I guess we can even collapse the tree into eat, throw again. Eat, throw again. Eat throw again, and so on. 
where obviously I eat on each throw with probability three quarters because three of the four outcomes are associated to getting to eat your lunch. What I can now say, first of all, in the formula, I need to know the probability that it takes a certain number of pairs of throws. So if I write X to be the number of pairs of throws until I eat my lunch, well, let's write down a few examples. So if I want X to equal one, that means I have to essentially immediately get to eat my lunch. I have to get one of the non-TT outcomes straight away. So that probability is three quarters. If I want to take two throws to get to eat my lunch, I've got to throw again and then eat my lunch. So that's going to be three quarters times a quarter. If I want to take three throws to eat my lunch, I've got to again, again, eat. So in that case, I actually get um, three quarters times a quarter squared. And then you can see really easily from having written down a, a few cases what's going on. The probability we take some general value is three quarters times a quarter to the x minus one, because you've got to get again x minus one times and then get to eat your lunch. So that means the expected number of pairs of throws is going to be the sum. Now, our sum is going to run from one to infinity because I have to take at least one throw to eat my lunch, but there's no upper limit to how many throws it could take. It could take 50 billion. It could take 50 billion and one. If there's no upper limit, we say it's a sum to infinity. And what we're summing is X. That's the value that you get multiplied by the probability that you get that value. So multiply by three quarters times a quarter to the X minus one. Now, this should really strike fear into our hearts because this is clearly not geometric because I've got X appearing both as a multiple and as a power, and yet it's an infinite series. So certainly in school, it's unlikely you've met cases of infinite series which are not geometric and they are tricky to evaluate. Really, in an interview, this is the type of series, the only type of series other than geometric, this exact structure we've got here, which you can expect to encounter. So this is covered in the sixth lesson of our interview primer course, but I'll also show you how to do it now in this video because there's a very realistic chance you might encounter a sum like this. First thing we'll do, just to tidy things up a bit, I'll pull the quarter, the three quarters, out of the sum. That doesn't depend on the counter variable x, so I might as well. And then the next thing that we need to do is, so there are a few ways we can handle these, but I'll show you a fairly simple way now. So something that can really help when you've got a series in sigma notation is to write the thing out explicitly. Sigma notation is a very useful tool for capturing an infinite or very long sum without taking up loads of ink, but it can obscure what's going on. So if I just briefly ignore the three quarters, let's just write this thing explicitly to see what we're really dealing with. So what we're dealing with is x times a quarter to the x minus one. So that's one lot of a quarter to the zero, which is one. And then I get two lots of a quarter to the one. So that's the x equals two case. Three lots of a quarter squared. Four lots of a quarter cubed and so on. So it's a bit like a hybrid behind, between a geometric series with the power going up and an arithmetic series with the number going up. Now, we've already remarked that the only type of geometric series which we really know, or rather the only type of infinite series which we know how to deal with is geometric. So it's not a crazy suggestion to wonder if we might be able to break this down into geometric series. Well, what's the most straightforward geometric series that has any relation to it? It would be this one. The geometric series with common ratio one quarter. The problem is, with that series, I don't have one more of each subsequent term. But what if I add another series which starts one term later and another series which starts one term later still and so on and so on because you see then I've got one of those I've got two of those I've got three of those I'm going to get one more of those from the next one so by starting each series one term later what we've managed to do is cook it up so that we do have exactly the right coefficient in front of each term. It's a clever idea, but it's useful to have seen this. Um, 
So the point is then that we've broken down this scary inf infinite series into an infinite sum of infinite geometric series, but that's fine because I can evaluate all of these. This one has first term one, common ratio a quarter, so it's one over one minus the common ratio one over three quarters. This one has common ratio one quarter, uh, so first term one quarter, common ratio one quarter, so it's going to be a quarter over three quarters, first term over one minus common ratio. The next one is going to be a quarter squared over one minus common ratio. And you see what happens is that each of these geometric series now themselves fall into a geometric series with common ratio one quarter. So if I add all this stuff up, I've got first term one over three quarters, which is of course four thirds, but I'll leave it as it is for now. And then I've got one minus my common ratio. My common ratio is clearly a quarter because that's how much more I have to go to each of these. So that gives me um, one over three quarters over three quarters, um, which is going to be, well, four thirds over three quarters. So it's four thirds squared, which is going to be 16 over nine. Now, of course, we have to remember that in our actual formula for the expectation, we'd pull the three quarters off the front. So that tells us then that the expectation, putting that three quarters back in, is three quarters times 16 ninths, which is in fact simply uh, four thirds. So that's how many pairs of throws we expect. And that means because each pair of throws is really two throws, we're expecting to have to throw the coin on average eight thirds, eight by three. Um, times. So it's no problem that that's not an integer. Remember, the expectation is really just like the average of what you'd see if you did the experiment many times. And the fact that this is quite a small number is not surprising either, because if you think about it on a given throw, you're overwhelmingly likely to eat lunch. So it's quite implausible to get a large number of throws required. As a closing remark, do just be assured that if it is the case that in your interview a concept like expectation comes up which you haven't seen before, the interviewers do understand that students cover the concepts in school at different orders and therefore they will be more than happy to either adapt the question if required or in most cases to simply explain the bit of material that you're missing.